Welcome to Alter Elev Elev <laughs> Elevations, from cultural rituals to socio-political and aesthetic performances by Professor Ella Diaz. Before we continue, please allow me to say the, the land acknowledgement. So while we gather at San Jose State University, we are gathered at on the ethno-historic tribal territory of the Thamian Ohlone, who were the direct ancestors of the lineages enrolled in the Muwekma Ohlone tribe and who were missionized into Mission Santa Clara, San Jose, and Dolores. The lands on which San Jose State University is established was and continues to be a significance to the Muwekma Ohlone tribe. We also recognize the, the ancestors of the Muwek Maloni constructed and maintained the three Bay Area missions. San Jose State University also desires to honor the military service of the Muwekma who have honorably served overseas during World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, Iraq, and who are still serving in the United States Armed Forces today. Next slide. So today uh, we are having um, Professor Diaz. Oh, so yes, we're gonna have Professor Diaz, but let me let me give you um, a little instruction. So we will be accepting questions during the presentation. I will be uh, collect, collecting the questions. Um, Professor Diaz will uh, go through her presentation and then we will address those questions that you've you've placed in the comments. So please feel free to ask questions uh, throughout the presentation, and then I will I will pro provide them uh, to Professor Diaz. We will be recording as well. So uh, if you're if at some point you need to either exit the program or uh, you want you miss something. Uh, we will have the um, the recording available uh, on our library website at uh, library.sjsu.edu slash art of remembrance. Next slide. So I am really, really very excited at uh, having Professor Ella Diaz here with us in this presentation. Uh, Professor Diaz is a new faculty member here at San Jose State, originally from the Sacramento area. She joins us from she joined us from Cornell University and came to SJSU this fall as professor and chair of the Department of Chicana and Chicano Studies. Um, in the programming, when we were starting to talk about the Day of the Dead, I asked if she would be interested in doing a presentation, and she has enthusiastically uh, volunteered to do this program as part of the Day of the Dead programming that the library is hosting. Uh, and just the final plug, we're in our final days uh, for the altar, uh, the Art of Remem Remembrance altar exhibit up on the fifth floor of the library. Uh, the last day will be November 4th. And I hope for those who have been able to see it, I hope you've been joining it. Thank, thank you for coming. Thank you for for um, uh, supporting the cultural work that we we have in this library every year, and and it is highly appreciated. I know it's I've been told so, um, but it, please, if you haven't been able to see it, please please take the time to go see it before Friday. And so now I'm going to pass the mic over to Professor Diaz, and so that she can begin this wonderful presentation, Ella. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, can everyone see my uh, screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So thank you to the San Jose State University King Library, um, the Africana Asian American Chicano and Native American Studies Center, or ACNA, and my colleague, librarian and ACNA director, uh, Kathy Blackman Reyes. Um, I also want to give a quick shout out to the Transforming Communities Program and Jamal Williams, Director of Advocacy for Racial Justice, um, of which this program is a part. So this is an informal talk about Dia de los Muertos and the altars and ofrendas that migrated with US Latinx peoples and specifically the Chicana diaspora and how these traditions have changed over time in terms of their forms and their functions in US Latinx communities. And a quick word on my nomenclature 
I use US Latinx to be inclusive of all people who identify as part of the culture and the diaspora. I use Chicana because it's my identity and it's more succinct in my presentation just to use the one term. I use Chicano though in historical terms like the Chicano movement and for artists with whom I'm familiar and I know their preferred designations. Um, this is an offshoot of my research on historical and vanguard Chicano artists, by which I mean the artists of the 1960s and 1970s, who forged a visual, poetic, and performative field of art that was simultaneously political, culturally nationalist, and aesthetically driven. So Dia de los Muertos is not really the center of my work, but the claims I make to you today are important, and I hope that they will leave you with a new perspective or an added dimension um, to your understanding of this long practiced cultural tradition in the United States. So, like I said, I've given this talk a few times, once in 2013 and then in 2016, and I did it on Zoom in 2020 amid the first year of the pandemic, and then again in 2021. And I always look forward to updating it because there's so much to share every year. Dio de los Muertos is constantly changing in Chicano art among the artists, the curators, and the practitioners. And it's always changing because it responds to the social reality and the contemporary moment. 2021 and now 2022 are no exception. And especially in 2022, I want to invite you to think about the term cultural appropriation and from a position of critical inquiry and less from one of a politically correct opinion of who does and who does not have the right to adapt cultural practices in our 21st century milieu of cultural convergence following 16th century conquest, subsequent centuries of colonization, 19th century annexations and nation making as well as 20th century world wars, immigration policies and economic treatises that have shaped our social reality. While this is not a definitive lecture on the genesis of Dia de los Muertos, most agree that it originates in the Americas and in the cultures of native peoples of Mexico and Central America. These worldviews melded and fused with the colonial Catholicism that disrupted but did not destroy pre-Columbian cosmologies, orders of time, and ceremonial practices. After all, Dia de los Muertos falls on All Saints Day and All Souls Day. And in most regions of Mexico, November 1st honors deceased children and infants, whereas deceased adults are honored on November 2nd. So Dio de los Muertos is not a timeless ritual since the survival of this celebration into the 21st century has not happened seamlessly. Rather, quote, it is the result of cultural, political, and commercial initiatives as well as media attention. And I'm quoting from Professor Regina Marchi of Rutgers University and her critical text, Day of the Dead in the USA, now in its second edition. Traditionally, Dio de los Muertos involves building private or family altars in homes or at grave sites and cemeteries. And you don't see an overabundance of skulls in rural communities and indigenous communities like you do in the United States and in our art spaces. Families and friends will leave offerings, favorite foods, pan de muertos, which is day of the dead bread. It's usually a sweet roll. There's calaveras azucar or sugar skulls for kids. And these are traditions around food, what's called foodways in material culture. But for the next half hour, I'm going to talk to you about how you go from this, say the traditional practices to this, a visual art genre or the aestheticization of a syncretic cultural tradition. What happens when you're not honoring a specific person or a deceased loved one? And the former print that you just saw was by Chicana artist uh, Linda Vallejo from 1978. And this one is by Alfred de Batuc, The Four Seasons, both of which announced the events at Self-Help Graphics in Los Angeles. Regarding historical, ch historical Chicana art spaces like self-help graphics, perhaps an altar or an ofrenda to, the honor, to honor the passing of a loved one or single life, but one that is connected deeply to a center like self-help graphics. And we're looking at artist Guadalupe Rodriguez who passed in the summer of 2019. Her altar was created with offerings by her daughter and Chicana artist Sandy Rodriguez and her sister, Dr. Elisa Rodriguez. Guadalupe's painting, Self-Portraits in the Pantheon, was reproduced as a silkscreen poster by Sandy and then displayed with the Marnarcas de Muerte she made with her mother in 2005. Stepping back from Sandy's reflections on her mother within a sacred Chicana art space, vanguard Chicana artist Barbara Carrasco also steps back and reflects on the larger grief or the collective mourning of a loss of kinship, family, and connectedness. In her offering, she writes in the 2020 catalog, this show available still online 
honors the innocent children who are traumatically separated from their parents while inhumanely detained in overcrowded ICE privatized detention centers in the time of COVID-19. Shizu Salamando, when this is all over, which is a visual material and textual, but also an a, a aural wordplay on the expression or cliche that we really used over the last couple of years, didn't we? When this is all over, right? In this, uh, so taking this expression and turning it into a mixed media piece and using washi paper flowers wire found chain link fence and saying that she constructed the flowers using a template from a craft book found in the Manzanar prison camp archives, which I continue to revisit because it is still relevant. Real flowers were not available at the Japanese American prison camps, so prisoners would make paper flowers to commemorate those who died. This piece is dedicated to the unjustly incarcerated. So Sadamondo is really tapping into a history of human caging, and it's a visual, verbal, and textual trope. And it reminds me of UCLA professor Kelly Little Hernandez's City of Inmates, in which she explores uh, how Los Angeles ended up with one of the nation's largest uh, jail systems. At Soma Arts in San Francisco, California, Peruvian-born Mission District artist Adrian Arias created these acrylic on paper portraits in 2021, titled Eight Minutes, 46 Seconds. Soma Arts tweeted that year, today we honor George Floyd on his 47th birthday, October 14th, 2020. And while Soma Arts is not a historical Chicana art space per se, it was the home of Rene Yanez for two decades and where he and his son, artist and curator Rio Yanez, have long planned, staged, and performed an internationally acclaimed Dia de los Muertos show. Also in 2021, Arias created a series to vi five victims of police violence in the Bay Area. So I've immediately demonstrated an evolution of Dia de los Muertos altars in Chicana and Latinx artwork. And I want to return to the notion of cultural appropriation because many of you may think these politically and purely aesthetic turns in Dia de los Muertos representational art is new or of the 21st century. Perhaps you suspect that they are a direct result of native and indigenous cultural traditions from Mexico and Central America, but that they're also derivative due to the incessant homogenization and commoditizing of cultures. And I'm not necessarily saying this isn't part of the story. But I also propose to you another understanding of Dia de los Muertos created by Chicana artists, curators, and creatives for over 50 years, which is that it's an art of the contact zone. What Mary Louise Pratt defines as social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power, such as colonialism, slavery, or their aftermaths as they are lived out in many parts of the world today. At the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago, uh, the Dio de los Muertos event started in 1986, according to Regina Marchi. Here we're looking at the 2021 show, paintings of the late Vanessa Guillén, if you recall the Tejana GI who was murdered on the base. Uh, Adam Toledo, the 13 year old uh, boy who was shot and killed by Chicago police. And to my left, perhaps you're right, these codex style but digital prints by Jorge Garza, the essential warriors of 2021. Speaking of essential warriors and workers, I find an interesting resonance at the National Museum of Mexican Art Show in 1995 and the ofrenda to Cesar Chavez two years after his death. Note the spelling or respelling rather of Chicago in that um, website address below. In Chicago, uh, the museum now is keeping its own website or digital archive, preserving its historical memory of the community Dio de los Muertos uh, ofrendas and altars from that 1986 on. This year's Dio de los Muertos at National Museum of Mexican Art it continues to uh, commemorate those that we've lost from COVID, as well as other tragedies, pulling on its permanent collection, as you see here, and centralizing uh, the, the family memories. Here we see a piece by Carlos Fresquez offering to my grandmother, Lorencita Fresquez, a mixed media piece from 2001. So the reason that I'm saying all of this pertains to cultural appropriation and the ongoing critiques made by cultural tourists, 
travel bloggers, media reporters, and even scholars on the loss of authenticity or authentic experiences in Oaxaca or central Mexico during October and November. And the claim is that traditions like Dio de los Muertos have been corrupted by colonial turned capitalist forces like Disney. Coco ruined Dio de los Muertos is one of the editorials I read online every year since its debut. And as some of us know, Coco became the highest grossing film in Mexican boss office history. And the idea that it's ruined Dia de los Muertos gives me pause because of the purity myth which, which, with which the notion is entwined. Purity comes from Western culture and colonialism. Ideas and claims of authenticity via purity are very dangerous when used against Chicana, Latinx, Native, and Black peoples, as if there is a direct path back to pre-colonial cultures. And if there was, what exceptional and groundbreaking art made from fusions and multicultural innovation would have to be let go of because they simply would not exist. And I do not mean to disregard or to reduce the violence of colonial conquests and the neoliberal forces that continue to undermine BIPOC communities. But what about the brilliance of resilience in our hybrid cultures? Moreover, Dio de los Muertos is about life in its pre-colonial expressions. And this is a continuing force in the contemporary reiterations. And as a mark of life, Dio de los Muertos is always growing and changing. Coco actually um, had cultural consultants, and I think all three identify as Chicana, including Lalo Alcaraz. And the story of his role in the film often starts with an earlier controversy of Disney attempting to copyright the name Dio de los Muertos and his response to that. And for those of you that don't know who Lalo is, he's a very well-known and, and famous uh, Chicano artist and, uh, and illustrator. His response to uh, Disney's attempt to copyright uh, Dio de los Muertos was Muerto Mouse. Um, a year later, after uh, putting this out, and it sort of gave Disney pause and they, they moved back, um, but a year later, he's actually asked um, to consult by a Chicana culture broker who's also on this uh, board of consultants. And he's uh, well known in the media for talking about how this came about. But the Chicana art story starts with Alcaraz, a Chicano artist who created Muerto Mouse in a Chicana art tradition, and also within his own sweet spot or, or hub of making satirical and political commentary on the commoditization of the cultures and the art of the Americas and the US Latinx people who made them. So to begin in a place and a time, I turn to where I'm sort of from, and that is Northern California and the Sacramento area. In the early 1970s, Chicano communities in Northern California began to implement neo-indigenous ceremonies like La Fiesta de Maíz, Fiesta de los Colores, Dio de los Muertos, and I call them neo-indigenous because they weren't exactly the pre-Columbian ones, uh, were they? No, they were uh, neo, they were new, recent, revived, modified. Indigenous spiritual ways, as many of us know, were forcefully removed from Chicana consciousness through a series of historical events, conquest, colonization in the 16th and 17th centuries, and then through institutional religions and curriculum policies in the US in the 19th and 20th centuries. And I'm referencing a host of scholarship here from Tomas Ibarro Frasto, Holly Barnett Sanchez, F. Arturo Rosales, and Laura Perez, to Teresita Romo, Kerry Cordova, and certainly Regina Marchi, who is that author of Day of the Dead in the USA, now in its second edition, and in which she asserts that Day of the Dead as we know it today in the United States would not exist if it not for the Chicano movement. Chicana reenactments in the 1970s of, of the pre-Columbian rituals were deeply political, urgent, and necessary. So the indigenous ceremonies and cultural events became neo-indigenous because while they were connected to spirituality in the Chicana enactments, they were also acts of consciousness raising and public forums of political visibility. The creation of altars and performance of ceremonies were neo-indigenous during the political moment of the Chicano movement because they raised Chicana and women's consciousness. Many spiritual performances were Chicana led and responded to social spatial injustices that came about from second class citizenship. Many early ceremonies were performed in spaces that were or had been contested zones amidst urban redevelopment and gentrification. And there were various occupations of parks and dilapidated public spaces. I think of Chicano Park uh, in San Diego, for example, and we can certainly talk about that um, at the end if someone asks. 
In Sacramento, California, the Dio de los Muertos traditions that began in 1975 continue. And these images are from the 2006 Dio de los Muertos ceremonies at St. Mary's Cemetery. This is Lupe Portillo organizing the events that year, and I'm pretty sure every year um, before and after. And scholar and theorist Laura Perez provides a critical analysis in Chicana art, the politics of spiritual and aesthetic alterities of these neo-indigenous ceremonies regarding the central role that women play. Perez deems altars by Chicanas a spirit work in which the spiritual is not an abstract or romantic notion reproducing the idea of a binary split between baser materials, physical and social reality, and a nobler spirit or realm of spirit, ideals, and intellect. Instead, the spirit work demonstrates the intersections of the spiritual, the political, and the aesthetic. So the act of creating an altar is at once an act of political agency and a creation of beauty. Catholic syncretism, as we see here, uh, all uh, brought together with a labor leader, a political history of enfranchisement and, and visibility in and of the public sphere. And this is just this year's announcement for what's happening or what happened today. Um, we used to make paper posters, La Palabra, as Jose Montoya would say, to get the word out. And now we create digital posters um, to announce Dio de los Muertos events. In Southern California, specifically LA, vanguard Chicana artists were invoking Day of the Dead for political statements couched within artistic performances in the early 1970s. Many of you know ASCO, the highly modernist, gender fluid and performative art collective that defied, resisted and disrupted many of the traps of Chicano cultural nationalism in their early 70s performances that took place amid civil unrest, police violence and the Chicano moratorium. You're looking here at the first performance stations of the cross dressed in priests robe like garments with their heads painted as calaveras. The artist carried a 15 foot cross made of painted cardboard along Whittier Boulevard and laid it at the front of a neighborhood Marine Corps recruiting center. There they observed five minutes of silence and homage to soldiers killed in Vietnam of whom a, dis a, a disproportionate number were Mexican American. So this is politicizing Dio de los Muertos aesthetics uh, to serve a different function in public space. We also see other iterations of ASCO using uh, Dio de los Muertos uh, aesthetics. So holding Las Posadas, for example, when it was canceled due to riots and police violence. But both of these performances didn't necessarily occur on Dio de los Muertos, but certainly they are in dialogue with its ceremonial and spiritual concepts, sort of enacting that spirit work to which I referred uh, using Laura Perez's argumentation. Other Chicana artists realigned the spirituality of the altar through its total aestheticization. For example, Amalia Mesa Baines is an artist, scholar, curator, and writer who has been involved in the Chicano movement since the 60s. And she became a, leader, a leading altar installation artist when she began incorporating Chicana culture and folk traditions into her work. Here we're looking at the uh, ofrenda for Dolores del Rio. Um, you can see that it's in collection actually with the Smithsonian and it includes a host of, of uh, materials. What's fascinating um, about this work is its playfulness and nostalgia for a movie star. It changes the idea really of, of honoring a loved one, right? And you should note the date on it, 1984, how far back this goes in terms of Dio de los Muertos and, and Chicana interventions. Then in the 1990s, Mesa Baines creates Venus Trilogy and continued in this vein of honoring non-traditional loved ones, including herself. In chapter one of the trilogy, Mesa Baines builds an altar or offering to her first communion. And notice the vanity, not religious terms, uh, not religious items. Um, Laura Perez argues that it's a place for self-care and for the accumulation of objects imbued with personal meaning. Look deeply into the mirror to see the image of Coatlacue. Venus Envy Chapter One is currently on view at SF MoMA on the second floor. I think it's closing in a few days, but there's still a chance to see it. Um, but back to the mirror, that's Quatlacue, as I said, the serpent skirt, the major deity in the Aztec pantheon and regarded as the earth mother goddess. And I really think an example of Mary Louise Pratt's notion of art of the contact zone. Think about Dio de los Muertos from a sense of self-reflection, the rites of passage of life, the deaths and the births of the self. And I couldn't help but think of Mesa Baines's canonical works 
and the ofrenda to Dolores Del Rio, when I saw performance artist and practitioner Nal Bustamante's ofrenda to Walter Mercado, who passed in 2019, and this was a part of the self-help graphic show in 2020. And as many of us know, uh, Walter Mercado is a legendary Puerto Rican astrologer, actor, dancer, and guiding light. And Bustamante tweets um, or tweeted her thanks to the uh, the her collaborator collaborators who helped her with these images. There was also a video installation, but really just sort of driving home this idea of the evolution of icons and commemoration from political to cultural, something that we all have in common via dominant culture. We see a lot of uh, ofrendas. Uh, um, or altars rather um, to uh, folks like Selena among many other uh, people that we've lost over the years from celebrity culture, but it's not necessarily participating in a cult of personality. It's a real sort of significant loss. In 2000, in 2000, the 30 plus years of Chicana Dio de los Muertos, Dio de los Muertos art began to be tracked, mapped, and recorded by preeminent Chicana art historian and curator, Teresita Romo. So Chicanos in Miquelan, Dio de los Muertos in California, opened at the Mexican Museum in San Francisco in 2000. And it's one of the only catalogs of California's Dio de los Muertos Chicano art history uh, to date. It tracks the major aestheticization of the traditions in Los Angeles and San Francisco. And the show represents a Chicana self-awareness, really, a self-consciousness of the political turned aesthetic sensibility of the enactments at the turn of the century. So it really reflecting, it reflects back on the 30 years of Chicano uh, artistic practices and rituals. And I want to draw attention to Rene Yanez's altar to Frida in 1978 and Rupert Garcia's print representing the long history of engagement with this particular icon um, and this portrait. In addition to the altars and ofrendas and how they've evolved in Chicana art over time, the procession also took on a political dimension for Chicanas in the 1970s, as I've certainly noted with ASCO. But now I want to connect with everyday gente, the people of Chicana and US Latinx communities who also adopted and adapted Muertos traditions to encompass a larger framework of meaning. And to do so, I turn to vanguard scholar and dramaturg Jorge Huerta, who writes that during the 60s and 70s, quote, it was no coincidence that Cesar Chavez's followers marched and continue to march behind the banner of the Virgen de Guadalupe, the Brown Virgin, national symbol of the Mexicano's indigenous identity. Both the procession and the patron saint of Mexico were retooled early on in the Chicano movement by farm workers and then Chicana artists, as we see Guadalupe everywhere in early and even contemporary Chicana art. She was used, quote, not as a politically paralyzing nostalgia for the irretrievable past, but as a reimagining and thus as a reformulating of beliefs and practices that grounded Chicana activism within a particular political visibility. And I'm quoting from Professor Laura E. Perez's book. And I add to Perez's assertion that Dio de los Muertos processions in this 1970s took on the same political meaning as the farm worker processions. Think about what the largely symbolic processions and marches made visible. As we know, many public marches end in catastrophic violence in the 1960s and 70s. And upon reflection, we have witnessed this in recent protests against police violence in BIPOC communities. So processions give a collective visibility and maybe a sense of safety to invisible and vulnerable peoples like farm workers, factory and cannery workers, and the multiracial and inter-ethnic American working classes. And while the procession and festivities began in Sacramento in 1975, they started earlier in 1972 in Los Angeles with self-help graphics and in San Francisco via Galleria de la Raza. And we're looking here um, at the processions um, in Los Angeles. What happens when you're, on, when you're honoring or celebrating an aesthetic in itself? or even performing it as a fashion statement that is a political intervention because of the materials you are using to make such fashion. Well, according to Laura Perez, paper fashions go back to the earliest days of ASCO in the 1970s when members made costumes partly from paper and cardboard. Founding member Patsy Valdez traces paper fashion back to Gronk, who was another founder of that collective, and a fashion show he organized in which, he, in which everyone was limited to the use of paper. Diana Gum 
Lisboa, also participated in this fashion show and continues to create these ludicrous, purely fantastical designs that Laura Perez calls a kind of ambivalent mimicry of mainstream fashion. Another longtime altarista and muertos fashionista is Ophelia Esparza. From East LA, Esparza began building altars for public view in 1979 at Self Help Graphics. And she participates in all community related muertos events, including the Calavera Fashion Show, the Walking Altars at Tropico de Nepal. And here she is in 2005 as La Catrina, that famous uh, Posada uh, figure. Created in 1999 by East LA artist uh, Reyes Rodriguez, the Calavera Fashion Show and Walking Altars features unique creations that combine modern themes with traditional Muertos iconography for a colorful, off-the-wall, thought-provoking runway event at the Tropico de Nepal Gallery in Echo Park. The, Cal the Calavera Fashion Show and Walking Altars idea was inspired by the clothes artist wore for the Day of the Dead, according to Reyes, who comments that he always felt that it deserved its own runway, thus our Calavera walk. It's not only Calavera couture, but performance art, music, and theater at the core of it are Chicano and U.S. Latino artists. Turning to the San Francisco Bay Area, the influence of vanguard Chicano artists and fashion icons from the paper fashions of Gamboa and Asco to the 40 plus years of Chicana procession and performance also shapes Muertos looks and styles in the San Francisco Bay Area. Notice the framework for this 2012 Dia de los Muertos season in the Bay. It maintains that traditional reflection or reverence of the past, the present, and the future. But it also has political undertones. Uh, um, for This photo shoot, for example, took place at a site, uh, then a site of rapid growth, the old shipping yards, now sort of one of the main veins of UC San Francisco. Vanguard Chicano artist and curator Rene Yanez and artist uh, Rio Yanez began to interpret Muertos through new technologies. And if we were in person, I'd be able to pass out my 3D glasses. I'm sorry that I don't have any to pass through um, the internet. I see Kathy laughing at me, but I have to look at these incredible uh, creations with my glasses on. So Rio grew up in the mission district and he's the son of vanguard Chicana artists as many of us know and he came of age in the post-civil rights post-1980s refugee crisis and the sanctuary city status of San Francisco and also amid the war on drugs the dot-com boom then bust and ongoing incessant and intolerable waves of gentrification for the mission so this piece I'm sorry it's blurry but it's a lot of fun in 3d it's a reflection of place it's a reflection of neighborhood people and politics of one's location and bioregion uh, amidst uh, uh, the uh, the erasures produced by gentrification Dio de los Muertos processions in San Francisco were first attached to the art shows at Galleria de la Raza and Rene Yanez. They now have a life of their own, celebrating an aesthetic in itself, a ritual or performance of life, which ironically is one of the oldest concepts of Dio de los Muertos and a legacy from Mesoamerican worldviews, more so than the colonial or Catholic notions of life as being separate or distinct from death. Um, this was from my last attendance in 2011. It's, it's been a while. Um, the Festival of Altars, which is three decades old, is actually, I think, happening today, starting at 5 p.m. But do not fear if you're not able to go. Um, they live stream it so you can find it on YouTube. And I've mentioned Rene Yanez a few times now, and he was one of the founders and former artistic directors of Galleria de la Raza. And Renee was instrumental in establishing the Day of the Dead as an important cultural celebration in San Francisco, and I argue throughout the region, as many people took their experiences of what they witnessed with them. I know I certainly did. The celebrations in the Bay Area, like Los Angeles today, are marked by increasingly large exhibitions, ceremonies, processions, and school-based activities. And here we see um, the very famous um, now gone billboard announcement for a 1980s exhibition at Galleria de la Raza, which was based on that infamous procession painted in Diego Rivera's mural dream of a Sunday afternoon in Alameda Park. Political and curatorial um, that is mostly certainly done in a Guad uh, Jose Guadalupe Posada tradition. And what I mean by that, well, the famous um, 19th century, early 20th century um, lithographer and illustrator and his political cartooning in Mexico that really influenced a generation of Chicano artists. 
Um, Posada is known for his figure of La Catrina and representing the Mexican elite as skeletons. And recall Lalo Alcaraz now and Muerto Mouse. And you can see a through line through social commentary and critique using humor, humor and lampooning. And if you look closely at, I'm sorry, at these figures, um, that's Diane Feinstein, that's Ronald Reagan. We can see the Pope. I'm sorry, it's blurry. Um, hopefully this will give you a little bit more definition. It's hard to pull things off the, um, the, the callosphere at times um, for free. The, the resolution is usually low. So using that story, and this is the 80s. And for those of us that are old enough to remember the 80s, you know, what's going on in 1983 to 1985? Why would these be the political um, figures that are being lampooned? The Pope is in there as well. In the 1990s, Renee moves uh, moved on to launch Rooms for the Dead and Labyrinth for the Dead at the Herba Buena Center for the Arts. These installation shots are of the altar made by Chicano artist Francisco Gomez um, of San Francisco and the Mission District originally. These are rooms for the dead, not just altars, and it denotes a sort of architecture, the building of an aesthetic. Note the slickness, the high stylization, the shaping of an aesthetic that's taking place here in the 1990s. Renee next moves on to Soma Arts, and the Dio de los Muertos, Muertos altars continue to evolve. Yanez and colleagues changed the sensibility of Dio de los Muertos by placing altars and ofrendas in a non-traditional context, and also continuing to mix, clash, and converge art in the borderlands. And now I'm going to attempt to show another video here of the 2011 opening. And I, I really want you to pay attention to the music. To do so, I have to... You can hear the music, but you can't see the screen, correct? We can hear the music. Okay, so I'm going to. We could. Oh. All right. Can we all see the screen? Yes. Perfect. What's really touching and really profound about this show is um, I feel this year more than ever, it's very, very personal. What's that? The screen is frozen. It's not moving. We're hearing the sound, but no, no movement. Okay, that's fine. I'll just go back to the, um, the slides then. Okay, can you see my slides again? Yes. Perfect. All right. I really just wanted folks to hear the music. That's certainly not um, corridos. That's certainly not uh, Mexican music. So Renee was very much so from the visual, the texture to the aural, the sound, uh, the, the different mixtures, uh, the, diff the coming together of different uh, uh, cultures of commemoration. Also pictured in the background when Rio begins to talk is Herbert Siguenza of Culture Clash. And he's there uh, performing, I think, in that iteration as Pablo Picasso. So Rene Yanez, uh, who passed is in uh, 2018, these ongoing themes that take place at Soma Arts um, from 2012 to 2018 to 2020 in the Soma Arts ofrendas, um, lots of future work taking place, uh, taking up the US Latinx and indigenous peoples concepts of future ancestors to foreground or position memory and commemoration as hopeful resistances to Western notions of the ends of world, perhaps thinking of Dio de los Muertos as the beginning of new ones. Um, Soma Arts goes online like everyone else in 2020 amid the pandemic, um, and you could back in 2020, those of us that were, were far away and, 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 and long held um, on the East Coast were able to tour um, the Dio de los Muertos exhibitions online. You see a 2018 portrait of Rene there by artist Adriana Garcia. And this year's artist, uh, this year's uh, iteration at Soma Arts. Uh, reflects on how those we have lost have taught us to love and to be loved in return. 
the prompt goes on, as we navigate a world troubled with war and injustice, we are more connected to each other than we ever thought possible. Love is the orchestrator connecting us to our departed and the actions grounding our communities in healing. To be loved, to be loved and to be loved in return. Dio de los Muertos 2022 exemplifies how the love between us and our dead continues to help us navigate the world. How beautiful of a theme for Dio de los Muertos in 2022. So uh, all of my thanks uh, for, thank you for staying tuned and for participating. Um, I just wanted to give you some, uh, some sources that you don't have to take my word for it. It's my little plug to uh, uh, the sources that I was using today. So Regina Marchi's Day of the Dead, Teresita Romo, Chicanos in Miquelan, certainly Perez's book on Chicana art and Carrie Cordova, The Heart of the Mission. If you're interested, you can uh, pick those books up. And last but not least, Transforming Communities, a Movement to Racial Justice Program Evaluation. Um, I think we'll be dropping the link to that in the chat if you're interested in giving us feedback. Um, please see that link and, uh, and, and, and submit that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ella. Uh, and thank you all for, for attending. Um, we are open to having a conversation with with Ella, um, this is a wonderful presentation. It's really the first time I've gotten her gotten to hear her present, even though I've I've known of her for many 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 years. Uh, and so I am excited to see uh, if there are any conversations. I have to say that uh, Ella, I kind of giggled. Uh, when you talked about the Calavera Couture, and I and I thought about Heidi Klum and Tim Gunn on the runway about the designers making, you know, uh, a Couture design and sort of thinking of that Calavera walking down the 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 walkway. I it, it just it just I just giggled in there. So I thought I thought that was. That was great. Oh, we have a we have a question. Can you please elaborate on the significance of La Catrina? Oh, um, the figure of La Catrina. Okay, cool. Let me um, see if I can go back to um, Esparza as um, the figure. Well, there she is actually right there. That's an iteration of her. So Jose Guadalupe Posada um, is a Mexican um, illustrator and lithographer, um, end of the, the 19th century, and really is responding um, to what is called the, well, I have to pull out all my Latin American studies um, uh, class notes, but responding to Porfirio Diaz and sort of the centralization of wealth and power um, in the city and in, in, the, in the central parts of Mexico and leaving sort of the outliers of the northern regions and the rest of Mexico. Um, uh, without the sort of uh, infrastructure or uh, subsidy that it needs. Um, so he begins to develop uh, these uh, political characters of the decadence, if you will, of, uh, of the, the wealthy uh, classes of the elite. And so that's the figure of La Catrina. Um, the Chicano uh, vanguard generation become, uh, becomes enamored uh, with uh, these images. Um, I think I'm not, I'm not certain, but I can speak a little bit of uh, the first encounters with Posada's, uh, Posada's images for Royal Chicano Air Force artists um, who also learned of Los Tres Grandes, the three great muralists. Um, I believe Diego Rivera and I think um, Jose Clemente Orozco had uh, uh, connections to Jose Guadalupe Posada um, that had uh, either uh, studied with him as a young boy or had seen their work. So by way of that, they were familiar with Posada. But then when Posada's images first come to the United States for exhibition, primarily by um, Chicana um, uh, uh, er, uh, early uh, arts workers, I'm thinking just Josie Talamantes, Tere Romo, they're a part of bringing a lot of those images over. So the Chicano artists really start to have exposure um, to Posada, and it becomes very popular. Um, the, the, I would say that's one of the first real sort of mass uh, disseminations of this image. And then you can really see the beginning of the Calavera sort of becoming a major icon of early Chicano art. Mm -hmm. And then even to this day, it's very popular. Okay. So um, there's also a question, since you're on that image, what happened in the 90s when you said the Pope was was there? So what was going on of the politics and within that? Within well, that this is, if you read the slide, um, the, um, these captions are pulled from Calisphere, which um, is 
basically uh, the UC portal for their, all their digitized slides and collections. Um, and Galleria de, Ra Galleria de la Raza is, I know this because of my books, um, is SEMA 4, that's the collection. Um, so they have all of their slides available and you can peruse online. Um, and as many of you know, Galleria de la Raza had this very famous billboard, um, which actually, I believe it was Yanez that was a part of taking this over um, and using it to uh, uh, communicate messaging uh, with the, the local community and not using it for commercial space. But this is 1987. So many of us um, may remember that the, the, particularly in San Francisco, the, the ACT UP and all of the response to the HIV AIDS uh, pandemic and, and plague and the real, uh, well, the real lack of care um, at that time from political, political leadership um, for the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, that were suffering and uh, suffering in silence and 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 uh, well dying in the shadows. Um, it's a real interesting resonance in 2020 to 2022 amid pandemic, um, because uh, now this pandemic has has uh, hit us worldwide, and I would argue that there is particular resonances around the shadows and the suffering. Right, so we have another question saying, I was so interested to see NorCal practices of the day of the bed dead living as I do in LA. Are there general differences between the two celebrations historically and today? Well, um, I can't speak um, widely. Um, what I would say is what a great conversation to start with your nor uh, Northern California um, friends and colleagues, your, your, your uh, Norteño kid. Uh, but what, what I will say is that one of the things that I noticed and when I uh, would talk more um, uh, directly about this topic and just for my own observations is that the Northern California traditions that I witnessed in the early 2000s, that was when I first started to witness them in Sacramento, um, seemed uh, more um, uh, family centered and more, uh, I don't wanna say conservative, but more in line with a neo-indigenous spiritual practice. I see in San Francisco and then in Los Angeles, I saw a lot more, um, uh, certainly I saw that as well, but I saw maybe a lot more pushing the envelope in terms of creative, um, creative boundaries, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. I would argue now though, in 2022, I would argue now that you probably aren't gonna see that much difference um, because the art, the the sort of the uh, Chicanx, US Latinx art uh, circuit is so interconnected because of all of the digital medias. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. So I was curious, I saw that in the in the um, one of the images that you have for the Rooms of the Dead, uh, Rene y uh, Yanez front, that was in uh, Yerba Buena, right? Or, and it was in 94. So I happen to have a t-shirt from 1990 uh, room, the rooms for the dead, uh, that happened at the mission cultural center. So mm. I'm, I, and so, you know, every time that we've spoken about this, I didn't realize that we had, been, we were talking about two different events. Cause I didn't go to the one at the Yerba Buena. I only went to the one at the mission, um, cultural center. So I, I have to assume that this was the, the, the one in the 1990 was, what got uh probably yang is there oh for sure and um yeah that's the thing um yeah and what's really funny is in the q a i see uh that the one and only francisco gomez uh who did this installation has written thanks for such a uh, thorough survey uh of dia de los muertos and for including the herba buena inst installations and i think um uh you're exactly right kathy and um i thought about uh Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts and including uh, the community altars. And then I know that this year, um, Adrian Arias has an incredible, and people can see it online, an incredible installation to the Uvalde uh, uh, victims um, using that same sort of, uh, uh, the, those simple portraits that he's developed on the large uh, bands of paper. Um, and so, yes, you're right. There, there are so many um, uh, centers uh, throughout this region, um, including our very own MLK Junior Library. I was just up there this afternoon and I was just, it's breathtaking, the altars that are on display. Thank you. Uh, I, it's, uh, it, is, it is something that I think, um, 
given some of the professionalization of the cultural artists and the altars, um, what I think I, I'm very proud about um, this installation is that it really represents not just the cultural artists, but also the community. And so we have students from high schools, uh, in addition to just people that that are, are individuals that want to create an altar and are welcome. So it's a very different space than, than what we would get if we were to have gone to a Yerba Buena Center or a Mission Cultural Center. So it, it, is, um, it, it is a very community-based um, uh, exhibit. So, and, and it is, so thank you for, for mentioning it. Are yeah, there any other, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, I just noticed that uh, Francisco chimed in to explain that history and confirms, he said it moved from uh, Mission Cultural Center for Latino Arts, then to Intersection for the Arts, uh, Herba Buena Center, and ultimately to Soma Arts. So there it is, you know, what a, what a wonderful moment where we can maybe account for that, or maybe I'll write that down very quickly right. so that I have um, that history. Right, it, it took a while to sort of get it, to the Yerba Buena Center, so that that's a that's a new one for me. I had I just I again every time we've spoken about it, it just never even dawned on me that there was another there was a there were a different exhibits. Um, so I still have my. In fact, I'm wearing it. My mm -hmm. uh, the T-shirt with the punk skeleton and and uh, and earrings. So it used to intimidate me when I got it, but I saw. It's still, it's still a great shirt. All right, are there any other questions? So, yes, and they were all curated by Ren Renee Yanez. I think, you know, that's that's the thing about looking at San Francisco and the development of R Rene in, in that area and coming into his own, right? And that sort of development of the, of the, of the Day of the Dead. So I don't know, Ella, you- no, I agree with you and, um... The reason why I really underscore, there are a lot of practitioners um, and historical figures of Dio de los Muertos that we should really um, celebrate. Um, but for me, um, uh, my consciousness was raised by Rene Yanez. And one of the things that I uh, appreciated so much about him is how um, inviting he, he, he is and he was um, to all people. And he always found uh, the syncretism and the mixture, the most fascinating, um, and the different layers um, of Dio de los Muertos and bringing together different celebrations uh, of, of uh, life in death and different points of connection through commemoration as a way of bringing us closer together um, instead of constantly living in a society that drives us apart. Um, the other interesting point that I'll make that uh, I'm just echoing what's been written by so many scholars, Regina Marchi in particular, is if you think about where we are in our Western culture, where we don't, um, certainly with the pandemic um, at the front of our minds, maybe this is shifting, but I would argue it's not, that we don't really have anything um, uh, uh, explicitly uh, built into our Western culture uh, where we can collectively mourn. Um, or where we can come together to commemorate. And if we do, it always has these other functions, be it nationalism, be it patriotism, be it whatever sort of assignment that we put on that. And so Muertos, Dio de los Muertos really becomes um, uh, uh, something very uh, immediately sacred to a lot of different types of people. And so I tend to be of the camp of the more the merrier when it comes to Dio, Dio de los Muertos. Um, I don't necessarily... Um, worry too much about commoditization. I don't worry about corruption of, you know, a tradition, uh, not when it comes to Dio de los Muertos, because there's so many ways in which we continue um, to use the commoditized uh, 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 trinkets and objects and repurpose them um, uh, for, sac for sacred value. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I see Maria Alanis is chiming in. Anzal Dua stated in Borderlands that our Chicana connection was seen as deviant. It's great to see this embrace of this central part of our culture in such a beautiful artistic representation, our connection to the spirit world, exactly. Yeah, I think one of the things that I've always, um, in, in talking with people um, who have lost ones and, and you know not wanting to go to the gravesite or what to do, just sort of stand there. And, I mean, I have conversations as to what you can do in, the, in, a, in a cemetery. 
um and it and it's it's very it's it's sort of like it's a practice right you have to learn that um what you do in a cemetery it's it's it seems very unfamiliar to us in in the US um and so um so but in Mexico it was something that I I grew up with and and I have carried it over here in the United States so that 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 is it is a learn learn experience and yes thank you for sharing the URL uh Ella I do have a uh, Thank you, Charlene, for, for your comments. Please remember to fill out the survey if you're starting to exit, that would be great. I do have another question. Um, if, uh, if Mariah, if you could please um, repost that. Thank you very much. So the question I have, uh, do, you, do you see any differences in altars or art practices now that exhibits are also online? Well, one of the things that I really loved in um, uh, 2020, with Soma Arts, which like I said, I'd been um, on the East Coast for a decade of my life. And so um, I wasn't able to attend anymore. And so when it went online, um, the digital technology that Rio and colleagues used um, to make the exhibition walkable. So it was sort of like a Google map in the sense that you could move around the exhibition and you could follow the air, arrows and walk up to spaces. That that was pretty incredible. Um, and I have to admit during that time, uh, coming online together and looking at the slideshow together um, uh, did create sort of that sense of community. Um, it's one of the, so I would say that um, this is an example of how these digital tools can bring us closer together. That's one of the differences that I've seen um, the way, and if you think about it, Peggy, the way in which digital tools are affecting how we do all of our work now and how we do all of our um, uh, uh, interactions, sociality with family, et cetera, et cetera. So I have a feeling that it's here to stay, but um, I would say that the art centers from self-help graphics uh, to Tropico to Soma Arts, as well as what Francisco was bringing up, the, the, the genesis and then trajectory of, of uh, rooms uh, for the dead, they were always using um, technologies. Renee um, was creating um, different technologies um, from the 1970s on. So okay, great. So I just want to also mention that we did a, a virtual reality Day of the Dead, um, um, I guess, presentation two years ago, I think. Um, and so I hope that we'll be able to share that link. It was a beautiful presentation that was done by one of our colleagues here in the in the library. We took pictures of, of, of the altars at people's homes and we created the 3D images of the altars and placed them sort of in a callejón using the walls of the, the, the villa in Mexico City. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, and Mariah has put it in the, the chat, and I would encourage you to take a, a look at, uh, at this um, online uh, presentation of, of altars. So we are coming down to our last two minutes. I just uh, want to just, uh, I want to thank Mariah. I want to thank, uh, you know, Ella for, for um, uh, doing the presentation for uh, Mariah helping us with this uh, you, the presentation itself. Um, it's It's been, um, these things are always awkward. You think you're ready for it and then you're still tripping over yourself. <laughs> yes, but but, uh, but I hope that all of you have enjoyed it. I um, I do wanna to mention tomorrow, if, uh, if you happen to be on campus uh, at 5.30 in the evening, the uh, consul, uh, the San Jose Consul of Mexico will be in the library doing a presentation of a book, and uh, they're going to have hot chocolate and pan del muerto up in the in the center. So if you need a reason to come up to see the exhibits, uh, the altars, this is a reason and 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 enjoy a presentation of a of a day of a day of the dead book apparently, uh, and so and also to to have a chance to meet the the consul if you've never met her. Uh, they're great people, great staff, uh, and encourage your students to attend. So I'm going to say, Ella, final words? Uh, I hope everyone stays well, and thank you for attending, and thank you. This was a great experience. So thank you all for coming. Please fill out the survey. Give us your thoughts. 
Um, and we look forward to seeing you at another uh, an event and exhibit of the Africana, Asian American, Chicano and Native American Studies Center at the Dr. Martin Luther King Library. Thank you and good evening.